Welcome back, you gorgeous humans, to the Canadian podcast portal to DJs, producers, electronic music, the industry, the stream, the dance floor, and everything that goes bump in the night. I am Jello, the host and Digi Sherpa for our audio and video storied adventure. Streaming is the darling of the moment when discussing music broadcasting, but it's not the true OG. Let's talk about radio. Let's talk about an incredible time in the big smoke where anyone in the metropolis could flip a switch or twist a dial on their FM box and dance music, including everything that's under that umbrella title, would be happening. What I'm talking about is 24-7, 365 days per year of FM dance music. New music, classic hits, all of it that could fit in between. Absolute heroes man the airwaves, wheels of steel, and incredible guests too. Live to air from the various venues in the city, and after midnight, that witching hour, shit would get so real during that broadcast that you could get your rave on nightly. This is the legend of Energy 108 in Toronto. And who was the program director that cast magic vibes across the FM airwaves? It's our guest with us right now. An innovator in radio and entertainment with four decades of awesome sauce upon the frequency band tenures that go beyond the dance music station like CFNY, also known as 102.1 The Edge, as well as prominent DJ that sorted out dance floors in legendary venues across Toronto like Club Z, Factory, Oz, and Joker. I'm stoked to be with an innovative dance music legend in Canada, and I know that you are too. We are together nearly 14 feet underground in the utility room with Scott Turner. Yes. <laughs> How Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for being with us. Absolutely. Absolutely. Really stoked to have you. I've, I've got a gazillion questions that I, I want to ask, but I've narrowed it down to about a dozen. <laughs> okay, no worries. Fire away. <laughs> Let's just jump right in. What was your call to radio? Uh, oh, let's see. I guess it was, in, it really started with Chum FM back in the early 70s. Uh, it was a progressive rock station at the time. This was the kind of birth of FM radio. And where you would hear stuff you wouldn't hear on AM radio. And there were some DJs like David Marsden, who later went on to CFNY, uh, John Donaby, and those cool guys like that back then. But, it, you know, a lot about the music because in the early 70s, again, this progressive rock and things, nobody else was playing. And FM radio at the time, there was like, okay, you guys just go ahead and play around. All the money was AM at that time, right? That's all where the money was. Was AM always talk radio or considered to be talk radio? Not talk radio, like just news. It, it was music. It was music. It was yeah. music oh, as well. Yeah, yeah. It was like that was the big where the money was, all the top 40 hits, you know, 60s for sure. So 50s, then, 60s, what 70s. What was the switch then? Why why did AM lose its popularity or its format as cons like like a music broadcaster? Is, I just feel like AM right now is just talking heads. Absolutely. That's, um, you know, AM does well with talk radio, but what happened really, I guess it's the fidelity of, of FM, right? When, once people, because at, at a time, I don't think there were even FM radios in cars, and then they started introducing FM radios, and people started buying FM stereos, and then it was like, oh, you know, nice turntable, nice sound system, and people got to hear stereo and that was the start of it, and then it was like, oh, you could hear music on FM, and it just sounded a lot better, obviously, right? And people got hooked, and uh, it just went from there. But that's really kind of, that was the shift, the, the fidelity, the, uh, the audio side of it. Um, and then uh, people just got used to that, and then everything just sounded like shit on AM, right? It was like just a small speaker and that. So that's kind of where it drifted to FM. So Chum was, was your call? With, with what was happening? Was That's, Marsden, was there someone else behind the scenes as well? Um, not really. I think uh, there, I mean, there was a program director involved, but it was just hearing the music and hearing the DJs. I got hooked on that. I was young, and it was like, it's like just, I want to do that. That's where I was like, I want to do that. And that music's pretty cool. And started discovering the music there. Um, and then uh, later in the later 70s, uh, that's when I discovered CFNY. Um, as Chum FM became more commercial, as FM radio became more successful and started making money, they started tightening the playlists. Uh, and then CFNY, you know, was born and there was like, wow, what is that shit they're playing, you know? And, you know, this is like late 70s, so punk is happening, a new wave is happening. And I was sold. It was like, okay, this is the future. You know, and that was it. And that's like, okay, I want to do this. I want to get on the radio and play that stuff um, and try to be cool. 
Was was it <laughs> the music that was getting played that called you to it? Was it the the mm. idea, the format, and being able to share with a, ten thousand people more at the same time? Yeah, I think I, part of the allure for me has always been the power of reaching a mass audience. Um, that was just the you know the the, the beauty of radio um, and commercial radio is the ability to reach just a massive amount of people, and that's pretty enticing. You know, the, I guess the ego in me was like, wow, that'd be cool, right? Uh, reaching a big audience and just trying to. I've always been interested in trying to expose new music, introducing new music um, to as big an audience as possible. That's that's a high for sure. You know, so that's always been part of it for me. When you were just discussing what part of the allure was the call for you, mm -hmm. and then you mentioned when the escalation of, of FM and its popularity that the playlist changed. So it went because I, I feel yep. like you were saying there was a, a, a grandiose freestyle that was associated with DJ. Be like, you know what? This record right now, woo! But does that happen today? No, no. So it, back in those like, progressive rock Chum FM days, they pretty much let the DJs pick the, their music, right? I mean, they, they had a playlist, they, were, they decided which albums and songs they could play. Okay. Um, but then the DJs could, you know, play with they wanted to, um, and that happened for me when I uh, got the chance to work at CFNY, which is 1984. Uh, you had a, a paper playlist, and there were only a couple of rules. There was uh, you indicated you had to play, you know, one of these and one of those. But you had a library behind you. And this is vinyl, I'm talking about just you know, just wall to wall, ceiling to floor vinyl records and you just picked your own music you just had to write it down right and there was you know some radio rules like you have to play 30 or 35 percent can 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 exactly right. so you know about that uh so that was no, no big deal but yeah that's and that that continued on cfny right up to about 92 and that's when they they said no more we're going to tell you what to play was there, was there ever a struggle to complete the playlist with CanCon? Did you ever feel like when that was happening that there wasn't enough Canadian music coming out? No, I don't think so. Um, you could argue, I think some people would say, you know, 25% would have been a better choice. Okay. And I think for a lot of broadcasters, they didn't like to be forced. I think it was the, you know, the, the CRTC, the government telling you you've got to play 30% or 35%, kind of pissed people off a bit. <laughs> I think if, if we weren't told to do it, we probably would have played 40%. You right, know? It's just, right. But I think it was just being told what to do is, it was annoying. Um, but I think, I think there was enough to play, I would say, 25% really good quality Canadian. Right. At that time. It got better as the years went on, right? As new artists developed. Depends on your format, right? I mean, because if you were... If it's 1985 and you're CFNY, you're not going to play Brian Adams. So big Canadian content artists, there's certain artists you couldn't play. So that, but there were some others you could play. Yeah, I would say, um, you know, it's not that difficult really to, to play 30%. What about what about playlists today? What what's that process like? Is, uh, it, is it, it handed down from head office, oh, if yeah. you will? And... Yeah. Oh, yeah. Every, uh, with few exceptions, with few exceptions, uh, most radio today is all pre-programmed. Um, and not only now by the radio station, it's done nationally in some cases. Right. You've got um, a programmer sitting in Toronto that's sending out a playlist that's being played at, you know, 20, 30 stations across the country. Is that beneficial? Does it help? I don't think so. My opinion, I don't like that at all. I okay. think there's a difference for uh, where, you know, look, if you're going to be, a, say, a top 40 station in Toronto, it's not going to be that much different than Vancouver. The top 40 is the top 40. But there's nuances, like, you know, in every city you've been to and DJed and whatever, there's this little different flavor in Toronto than there is in Calgary and then there is in Vancouver. Of course there is, right? So I think you have to allow for that. So, and then let's be honest, everybody outside of Toronto likes to hate Toronto. So anytime someone's controlling things from Toronto and saying, here's how you do things, people don't like that. 
you probably found out. People na- love to na- hate. It's a national. It's a national thing. It is. Yeah. Oh once, yeah. Once you Let's leave all the hate Toronto. It oh, turns yeah. into something else. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if it's hate is da- dashes of disdain or yes, right. Yeah, and jealousy is a bit there okay. too, right? Maybe. Yes, it, there's a bit of that too. So uh, yeah, that that's going on today. There's uh, it's pretty controlled today. The playlist. I've seen. I've seen some of your social media posts about dance music. Yep. And rave. Yep. And its yep. roots. How did you fall in love with electronic music? Um, it started with CFNY, the music then from both playing in the clubs, um, the music we played from, you know, everybody always name checks craft work. You go back, um, one of the first artists. But obviously, those electronic artists that started just around early 80s, um, from Depeche Mode, um, New Order, of course. Uh, and then there were, as you go into post-punk, you know, and there was uh, bands like uh, uh, Front 242, um, Nitzereb, others that did that industrial kind of electronic sound. Right. From, and the New Orders and the Depeche Modes. Um, Erasure, Yazoo, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I was really into that stuff. I thought it was really cool. And, uh, and, and just, you know, from artists that just could make a record, drum machines to uh, guitar sounds built on a keyboard, and all of that stuff that was very, very new, the, the drum machines and the other samplers and things that were happening in, in, in early 80s, was fantastic. I mean, technology was just, was a huge driver of that, you know, electronic sound, right? And so that was, yeah, that was the inspiration of it all. And then you, you fast forward to um, the late 80s when, um, you know, just the stuff that was coming out of Detroit and coming out of New York and coming out of Belgium and coming out of um, Germany, um, just the techno, basically, that was starting in the late 80s. And, uh, and Sheffield and Northern England, the Warp label and all that stuff was just blew my mind. Uh, and, you know, when we were hearing the stuff coming out of all these different places and then hearing techno and then hearing about this thing called a rave was happening in the UK, I was just totally hooked. Like, this is, this is the coolest shit, you know. And, uh, and then we go into the whole rave scene. Um, of what happened with electronic music there, there, and then on is just and continues today, right? Are, are yeah. you do you do you still have the same passion from that that spark then now? Yeah, I would say you know what I, I to be honest, uh, I I'm not listening to as much new music um, as I used to, um, yeah. and I'm not de- DJing like I used to. Right, right. Um, uh, you know, I'm a little older and <laughs> a little and so, wiser, a little wiser, but you know, so I, you know, I still have a, you know, I still have a great, uh, you know, the passion for the past and the music of the past. I still love that stuff. Uh, if I had more time, uh, I would like to spend more time listening to some new music, you know, uh, but you know, it's funny as you get older, you just, you, you're, your interest in time go in other areas. Of course. Right, and also you get sidetracked with other things. Um, so I don't quite spend the time that I would like, but I, you know, in the future, you know, when I slow down a little bit and stop working so much, uh, definitely like to discover some new music. I feel like when you're on social media, at least the posts that I've seen, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, yeah. I'm not over, but Scott yeah. posted, I gotta. <laughs> <laughs> but I do see it, I do yeah. see it in the feeds. Uh, and when you are posting, you're posting about you're posting about music, yeah, and it feels like every time that you're posting about a song, that you've got like the immediate reference of it, where it came from, the year it came out, who did it, uh, almost nearly sometimes I've, I've maybe even the why. So like within a quick paragraph of a little blurb, I'm able to get what the fuck, what the fuck the song was, right. and then and then boom, and then you post the track, and I'm I'm like. Holy shit! Like this, and and I, for me, it's a it's a really big deal. I don't, I'm not quite sure if somebody has talked to you about what it is that you're posting, and for me, I feel it's very important. It's important so that, well, what that 
did, what that started, where it went. I mean, these are origin points. It's the reason why I'm able to do and a million other humans on earth what we're doing right now, yeah. you know, is because of this. And that's why I, I, I was wondering, why is the history of electronic music so important? Well, those posts you talk about is the, I, 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 I'm obsessed with, um, you know, history dates and release dates. And, you know, when I collected a lot of stuff over the years, a lot of information, um, hung on to a lot of things. And I, I got to a point where I have all this stuff. Uh, and I also kind of have a bit of an addiction to research. <laughs> I just love researching things. So I've built this stuff over the years, got all this information. I thought, what am I going to do with it, right? And I've had my on-air radio years talking about this stuff. And I thought, I need to share this. I've got this stuff. I want to share it. So that was the easiest, quickest way, um, social media, to share, hey, you know, hey, you know what, 30 years ago, 25 years ago, um, it's, it's just sharing that information I thought people could get a kick out of, both from a nostalgic point that people could go, oh, shit, I forgot about that song. Right. You know? Or I forgot about that. Um, oh, and that album or that, that concert, that sort of thing. Um, so it's partly that, but also I know for younger people that are rediscovering older music, that are discovering music from the 80s, discovering music from the 90s, um, electronic music and that, they, they might have a reference point, especially for the raves. It's like, hey, you know, raving in, in Toronto started in 1991, really 1992, 1991, 92. Um, and some people are like, wow, I didn't realize that. And, you know, well, here's some of the information about it. It's really cool. And here's some tracks that you may or may not know about. And somebody getting off on that is great. The other side of it, which is purely um, selfishness, is I wanted to build a playlist. I have all this music. Uh, you know, I have a huge collection like anybody else. And I've never really archived it properly and put a playlist <laughs> together. So that was it, honestly. Honest to God, I swear to God, I'm, at, I'm somewhere at 9,000 entries right now of various... Um information so i've got this all in a spreadsheet that goes on forever so i'm over nine thousand entries now from concert dates to you know rave flyers to um, this song was released that album was released and uh it's also yeah i'm building a personal playlist for myself that's i'm gonna you know have different ways of shuffling it um and i'm not finished yet and that's part of the thing is i, I just <laughs> love researching and of course you go you once you go down here and you go oh I didn't know that that band had another album after that and then I'm discovering that so I am kind of listening to new music and discovering new music that way uh, and I miss stuff too that's the other thing when you you're doing research um, like for example not to go off on a tangent no no here, no but tangents are welcome. I was so much into dance music and into raves and you know the 90s I just stopped listening to you know alternative rock music you know pretty much completely wow and so what I've done in the last you know number of years is I've been going back into the 90s to look at some alternative music that I, I just didn't have the time to get my ears into and discovering you know I've heard oh you know there's Radiohead and there's other bands but I never spent the time with them so I'm able to go back now and and just listen to some of those albums, at least make notes of them. Like, hey, I'm gonna be able to listen to this, and you know, reading reviews, going, shit, this album in 1995, you know, was like on everybody's critics list, and I'm like, fuck, I didn't know about that album. I was at a rave, you know, <laughs> till eight in the morning, right? And uh, I missed that, so. It's going back for me too to kind of rediscover things, but yeah, just sharing it is just a big part of it. And you know, a pretty pretty nice playlist I've been uh, building. Yeah. Have you ever consider sharing it, like as a blog or? or yeah, or maybe. That yeah, people can get I into? mean, you know, people. Few people have said do it, do a podcast, to do a blog, and and I had thought about that, and then I got sidetracked and busy again, and I, I thought, oh, maybe maybe another time, um, and I thought, oh, it's a lot of work. I'm gonna have to run around, you know, um, getting interviews and chasing people down and. I'm like, I don't have the time for that right now. So I got busy again. Um, I was that where a lot of that research comes from, and you see those posts because right. I was off you, off work for a couple of years. You okay. know, I lost my job. Okay, what am I going to do? You know, um, and so 
well, I know. I'll just start doing this research, you know. So right. that's, where that, that, that's where I had the time to do that stuff. So when you see a post every day, and uh, for those that don't follow me at, on Twitter, it's at Scott Turner. And just you can find Scott Turner on Facebook and it just you can friend me and uh, you know, follow me. <laughs> and I'll, I'll invite you in as a friend. But I do, I do posts like every day because I just, I just pull it up and it's like this is what happened on this day and I just post it. How were you getting... Yeah, this new music then, at that time, mm. were you physically going into record stores and finding yeah. records to play onto the radio? Absolutely. For first of all, for the CFNY days of the '80s, um, you know, we had an amazing music department. Um, you know, Ivor Hamilton and some of the other people that would go down, and I would go down myself sometimes down to. Um, the record peddler was a, a big source of the information for CFNY in the 80s. Record peddler was fantastic. And then you go into the 90s. Yeah, all of the music that we were playing on Energy 108 um, was, yeah, from play to record, uh, from, we had a couple other sources. Um, uh, just, and then the record companies were great at feeding us stuff, you know, our relationships with the record companies, um, but also, uh, developing relationships with labels in, in Europe, and also getting on a plane with a, a few of my friends. We'd get on a plane and, and go to London, go to um, up to uh, Manchester, um, all those different you know key record stores uh, back in the day. So you, know, you were we bringing music to... into Toronto that was that Oh, yeah, was absolutely, overseas. like right off a plane. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Awesome songs. Yeah, oh, fantastic. And it was literally, hey, we just got this, you know, Boom, right on the turntable. So was there ever a competitive edge between the DJs that were on the station? Would you guys ever have, be like, like you know what's in my fucking bag? And someone would be like, yeah, you know what's in my bag? Did yes. you guys have those moments with each other? Yeah, totally. <laughs> you try to one-up each show? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, we did. We basically did have a, a, a playlist of sorts on, on energy. Um, but when it came to the specialty shows um, in the evening shows, um, you know, it was, you know, especially for, you know, Don Burns, Dr. Trance, uh, Flipside, and um, Mastermind, and the hip-hop. It was like, you guys play whatever you want, whatever you want. And Shep, of course. And that's how I pulled Shep from CFNY over to Energy 108. You know, the Shep said, they, Scott, they just told me I have to, here's, here's your playlist, Shep. You know, they handed me a playlist. I said, Shep, it's time to go. You know, come on over to Energy 108, play whatever you want. Wow. And he was like, okay, we got to do this. And um, so, it, it, but the other funny thing about um, battle of of who was first with, with with tracks, and I think that happened with with Energy 108. You know, a lot of the club DJs had a lot of power um, and cachet with the stuff they had, and kind of that was where you heard the new tracks. And I think what started to happen with Energy 108, we were getting some of those tracks and playing them first. And I think it was pissing off some of the DJs in the clubs because. We were getting some of the stuff first. Um, not always, you know, but there was that battle. There was a fun battle. Of would that break the cool? Would it, that, that, that cool moniker, that tag, would it break the cool if, if Energy 108 hit it first before it, it went to the club? Yeah, I think it pissed a few DJs off. Yeah, yeah, I think so, yeah. Because they, the, they, they, they were the kind of kings of the new music. And then we started getting some things before some of the DJs. Not always, but we did. And uh, that, that would... Uh, that would piss them off. Yeah. You touched on a couple of things I'm definitely <laughs> very interested in. For example, one of that is that you, you mentioned a bit of a battle when it came to music and, and a playlist being handed to uh, a DJ performer on the on the airwaves. Yeah. Like like Chris Shepard. Yeah. What was the prominent struggle with trying to get electronic music on the airwaves in Canada? Why why mm. was why was techno a bad word? First. Um, you know, mainstream commercial radio, you know, by and large, like Energy 108 and CFNY for that matter are anomalies. You know, there aren't many stations like that they, and, and for commercial radio. So by and large, you know, across the country, you just don't hear that kind of stuff on the radio. And, it, you know, I remember, and again, the Toronto thing, because some of the record companies were like, wow, you added that. That's great. And they'd phone radio stations out in Vancouver and Edmonton and whatever and say, <laughs> well, Energy 108 in Toronto is playing this. And they, that would piss them off even more. It's like, yeah, so it's a Toronto station playing it. That's even more reason not to play. Right. 
great. So <laughs> what do you do? Um, and it was just, you know, and a lot of radio in Canada, you know, the PDs, the music directors, the people in control, in a lot of cases, uh, sorry, were kind of, you know, older white guys that grew up on rock. Um, and that's not all cases, but in a lot of cases, they were just so re far removed from any, you know, club music and that culture or being in clubs. It was just, uh, that was the story of a lot of radio in Canada. So just try to get these programmers and, you know, they, they got their playlists and they always, you know, see the billboard chart and they look at what's happening in the U.S. in the major markets and they're all stuck in that, you know. Now, that's the that's way a lot of the thinking was. So it was really hard to get not only electronic music, but to get hip hop on, you know, commercial radio in Canada. Holy shit, that was hard. You know, it just, yeah, very, very hard to get that. It's a different world now, but back then, yeah. Well, and, and to be honest, you know, some, some electronic music, um, you know, in, in radio, you tend to play a three and a half, four minute, song and it's got a chorus and a hook and that sort of thing so you know not all electronic music is designed to be played on the radio per se you know it's meant for a club by and large um, but over the years you know remixing and you know uh, radio edits and you know putting a vocal is how many club tracks started as inter instrumentals right and it was like you know labels would see how popular it gets and going hey why don't we stick a vocal on that uh -huh. you know and uh -huh. it was like shit okay i didn't thought of that you know the right. producer dj said oh i just built this for the club right and then it, you know another producer steps in going you know we stick a vocal on this and maybe a little rap here or something you know it could be a huge hit <laughs> and and boom right and that happened and that happened you know there'd be people going okay you ruined the track but you know in the club you could still play that version and on the radio, you could play another version, you know? Right. Depends what time of the day. Like, you know, at energy daytime, we had to play more accessible music. You know, when it got to the evening, we could get a little more experimental. And, of course, on the weekends, it was game on. Just let's party, right? So with this oil slick hill that, that mm. radio had to climb, that DJs who were selecting their own music to play on the airwaves, this, this oil slick hill that you were just describing... And, and I think that's probably an accurate way of describing it. How did Energy 108 start? Because if, if that's against the, the, the FM grain. Yeah. So what, like, how did, how did, like, who came up with the idea? How, 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 did, how did someone green light it and say, yeah, dance music, 24-7, every day, all year round, let's go. <laughs> because I can, only, I can only imagine what was the start of Energy 108. Is this 97, 98? Uh, 91, basically. Yeah, Energy 108 started in, actually 92, sorry, it's be 30 years. Um, it started as Dance 108 in 1991. Um, and 92 is when I went there. So it was, you know, I'll give credit to Bill Evanoff, um, and who, whose son now runs the company. Bill passed away a couple of years ago. Uh, and now Paul, uh, his son, runs the oven off. They've got stations across Canada now. Um, but One of the it, last independent radio broadcasters see, in Canada, aren't they? There's the key, there's the operative word there, independent. That's really how it was, you know, that, that Bill um, saw there was an opportunity, you know, both by a format, but, but doing something that nobody else was taking a chance with. Uh, and it started as Dance 108, and that's, that's where I went to Bill and said, this is great what you're doing, but I can take it to another level. I, I think you're doing, you got the right idea, right. but we can tweak this. Um, and that's when we started Energy 108. And um, it was just being bold enough to take that chance to, do, to play music that nobody else was playing, to um, just take a chance. Yeah. So the whole thing began as a gamble. Yes, but I think a, uh, a calculated, we knew that, um, for example, there was, you know, the clubs, we see the popularity of clubs and people are going to clubs and they're, they're busy dancing and they're busy. Okay. Uh, I think there was this sort of stigma of 
you know, in radio, it's like, well, that's for the clubs. You don't play club music on the radio. They're just this, this really, like, that was just a no. You can't do that. You know, that's a club. That's for but I think um, some people were convinced, and I was convinced that you can do that. And then we also knew from, you know, from, an, uh, from, from hip hop and R&B that a lot of people, we knew a lot of people were listening to WBLK in Buffalo. Uh, it was a huge station that, that just people tuned into because you couldn't get, you know, that story, especially a lot of the uh, American um, R&B and funk um, that was, they were playing that nobody, you could hear it in the clubs here, but it wasn't on radio. So that was part of the impetus of it. Um, and then just, you know, as, as the 90s were, as we're going into the 90s, there's just the, the quality and, and new dance music was coming out. You know, and, and house music was happening, and techno music was happening, um, and then you know, from the commercial side of things, you know, the Euro, the Euro, whole Euro side of things, from Labouche to Real McCoy, and all that stuff was happening. There was very melodic, accessible hook, you know, just perfect for radio. Um, that was a whole other side of it that exploded in the '90s, and the, and then the club scene in in, in Toronto exploded in the '90s too. Um, and that just drove the whole thing. Was the radio station easy to staff? Was there many humans that could fill the positions that came from an electronic music place? Uh, yes. Um, I think you do. People just find you. I think they just, they just sort of happen and are, are, they gravitate towards, you know, lots of people when they hear something like that go, I want to be a part of that. And they, you know, they introduce yourself from, from mastermind was it magnetic that yeah absolutely that okay. came to me saying hey man I can do hip-hop and um, I'm your guy and he convinced me and and I mean he's just one of the you know innovators the early innovators of hip-hop in Toronto mastermind and what he did on that show um, and people like uh, obviously Shep was a huge part of it um, you know at the the tail end of CFNY late 80s um, early 90s, 90, 90, 91, 92, that um, we were all just getting really turned on to techno and, and this rave scene that we'd heard about in the UK, and we all wanted to do it in Toronto. Uh, so Shep was a big driving force of that. Um, and there were other people that, that, that came to, from Wayne Williams and other people that were really into house music um, that, that was really helping us drive that on the station. And uh, it was just a, a community of people that just, you know, that just, it just kind of happens organically. There's just a lot of people that are just tuning into some sort of, you know, I, it's a bit corny, but it's true. I really do think there's a consciousness. Um, and that's worldwide of just people are just kind of thinking of the same things at the same time. It's not like one person invented it or thought about it. There's a lot of people thinking about it at the same time, and it just kind of happens. Big puzzle. Yeah. And it's pretty cool when it happens. Yeah, it it felt yeah. like a magic moment in Toronto. Yeah. I mean, I was, I was, I was just a kid, but I I knew I knew that, I mean, especially then, you know, to get new music, access to new music, to discover new music, it it was through radio, you know, um, because because record stores I felt were intimidating. Yes, if you were new. And trying to figure out your way going into a record store, you know, fingers crossed that you picked the off hour and the off day when it wasn't going to be either shipment day or a day <laughs> when all the other jocks are showing up to shop because, True. you, you know, you kind of get shuffled to the back if, if that was the case. You get a little, little bit of a shoulder check, yeah. you know, so it, and, and the, and of course, the, the irony about that is that being someone new going into a record store, if, if you give a shit, I'm, I'm making a giant assumption here. But then the, the art of crate digging starts there. Yeah. Because no one's fucking helping you. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right? You're not getting a hand. Yes. From, you're not getting a hand from any of these yeah. guys. Yeah. You know, which is funny because it's retail. You think, well, we've got all this black crack here. I want to get the fuck out of the store. <laughs> Don't help that guy. You know what I mean? Be like, leave that fucking guy alone. I've never seen him before. Who is that guy? He doesn't belong here. Yeah, it's tough, you know, and I think, uh, and I've been in those, those scrums of, and then that you, when you see, just a store full of you know DJs and other um, you know p 
people into the into the culture and the music and and somebody's you know grabbing a piece of vinyl and putting it on and dropping the needle for maybe 15 seconds and you hear a couple of beats and then okay that's that record and it's like you got to decide i'll take that or like what i didn't hear anything right I, uh, that's tough i was fortunate again with the label connections being sent so much stuff right like um picking stuff up myself from going right to the source and in some of these um eastern block and other record stores in the uk and you know just being connected to the labels that they started sending us stuff so i have the luxury of that and, and eugene god bless him you know he kept a, a little bunkie of stuff for me and you know and say scott come back come back here you know and i can't do my eugene impression there's uh, you have to get sweat on there uh to do a Eugene impression. Is it, uh, is it solid? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, it is, it is the best. It is the best Eugene impression. Uh, so, um, yeah, so he'd have stuff in the back, yeah. yeah. And, and so, I, I, you know, I just walk in there and here you go. It was pretty cool. Yeah. You mentioned um, earlier that there was uh, influence via WBLK that was in Buffalo. Yeah. Now... That was a big deal in Toronto. Once... once Dance 108 moved to Energy 108, and mm -hmm. like the logo, really, I felt like the logo. You just started seeing it everywhere. There was a mark, big marketing push across the city. Yep, it was not. It was easy to walk into a retail store that you know, a Panorama or a Levi's, and and that was that's what would be getting played on on the store stereo. Did the U.S. ever get 108? Did you did you did you guys know that there would be people that would be close to the border, like upstate New York or Michigan, that would have an opportunity to get this, you know, a crackly shit signal of FM yes. that would that would be just enough? And and what was that like once once that feedback when when you had that to know that what it is that you were doing in another country? And I get it, so it's the states and our neighbors. It's still another country. Yeah, you know, and I mean, as you mentioned earlier as well, that you know, if you go to Vancouver, it's got its own culture. Alberta, it's got its own culture. Yeah, fucking New York State's gonna have its own culture, which is very different than the culture of Michigan, if you will, right? Yes. Like, so, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so knowing that that this music is reaching and it's touching across the border, did, did, was that was that ever a conversation piece for you guys? Or yeah, huge. And you know what they had there? There was a, a thing for a while. The there was a dance music seminar, seminar that Billboard magazine put on. They did one in San Francisco, uh, Chicago, I think it was in New York a couple of times, and we went to those, and we would just talk to like-minded people, and it, the word got around, so it was really cool going to a dance music summit seminar in San Francisco, walk, and people walking up to you going, I heard about Energy 108, and getting calls from people in Chicago and in New York, and you know, we were even told that... Um, there was a dance station that was launched in New York. It's still there today, and now I forget the name of it. Um, but uh, I was told it was inspired by Energy 108. It followed. Yeah. Right, because there was nothing like this in North America, was yeah. there? No. So, I mean, at, at yeah. first. No. May, na, maybe now, Correct. Is, okay, or, or what followed is you're mentioning, yeah. okay. Yeah. But there had to be this for, I, don't know, I call, I always say, this is my favorite thing, so I call it blood in the water. You know, when drop a blood in the water and all the sharks come. Sure, yeah. Right, okay, so, but it had, had energy went away, not put that blood in the water. Yeah, there what, were. What would have been? Yes, yes. Maybe down the line, someone would have come along and they may have also potentially fucked it up and then everyone else would have went, no, that didn't work. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like a bad yeah. movie. Be like this genre, we're doing a Western. Be like, do the Western, the Western fails. Be like, yeah, no more, no more Westerns, right? <laughs> so, so that's, I, I'm just, because to me, this is wild. Yeah, and, and you know, the other funny story about it is that we got calls, uh, and not only from the U.S., but we started, this is where we started getting calls from other stations in Canada going, I heard you do this live-to-air thing from clubs, <laughs> oh, right? Hi, you're fast-forwarding me. I love oh, it. Thank okay. you. No, so, and it was like, and we hear you're making a ton of money <laughs> because we would do... A live to air right. from a nightclub. As you know, you have the music in the club, the DJs playing the club. It just, we do it at the time, it was through ISDN lines. Remember ISDN? Do you remember those? ISDN? No. Yes. 
<laughs> so ISDN, yeah, yeah look at our techie guy, geek guy here. That's good. They were called ISDN. It was like this new thing that you know brought you really high quality. So you could run these in stereo, ISD, and you paid for it. There was a fee for it, but you ran it from the club back to the radio station. And, and you basically ran it on the air. So the funny part That's was... That's how the live to air happened. Me yeah. Me mechanically, technically. Yes, right. yeah. Okay. ISDN, I think you could do it before that through these bell lines that were very, you know, unreliable and problematic, yeah, da, 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 and expensive. And then uh, ISDN, I think it was a way to it coded it from the club and ran it through the lines like, almost like, like, a, a, like, a, like a, a digital hack. file that was you know, compressed or something okay. and came out the other end. Too technical for me. Anyway, ISDNs were a game changer for, for doing live to airs um, and doing them efficiently. And you could just take this box to the club and take them to any club. Then you just hooked them into the mixer and off you go. Uh, but the funny, funny part was us getting calls going, here we hear you, you know, these radio stations going, you know, we got these clubs that want to work with us because we hear you're doing it there. Right. And, you know, we were charging, you know, upwards of four or $5,000 a night. Right. The club would pay the radio station. Right. And it's like, okay. And we put our host there and, and we'd often work with the DJ they had at the club. Right. So anyway, these fast forward, these radio stations would call me from, you know, Edmonton or Calgary and go, hey, great. So um, we were talking about doing that here. And uh, so, you know, you, you give them a playlist, right? Like, you know, the, the stuff you play on the radio, you give them the playlist. I go, no. We just, you know, we just run the music from the club. It's like that's their club, and we trust them. And the, they were shocked that we didn't have a playlist. Like you didn't hand a playlist to, to the DJ at the club. Uh, and a lot of them wouldn't do it. And that's why, the, you know, <laughs> it was like, no, it's, it just trust them. And they just didn't have that ability of trust. And they were, you know, totally terrified of running, you know, full-on club music you know, on their radio station. Um, but we had a lot of calls about that. I don't know how many actually did it. A few, I think a few did. I'm, but they, I'm imagining, I mean, you, you, live to air became a thing. Yeah, and I, but I do think some of the stations said, look, you, we need you to play these songs, you know, the, these big hits, you got to play them. Over there. Yeah. Not, not with y'all, y'all. No. Right. No, you know, I mean, you know, you trust the DJ. You trust the club DJs, and, you know, they know they got their crowd, and it's all good. Were the clubs set up where they were paying SOCAN fees, or were you guys keeping a track of what was getting played and then submitting it, or was it just Wild Wild West and Six Shooters at the side? Yeah, so, um, you know, for those that know a little bit about that licensing, so the way it works is um, the clubs, you know, pay, I think, I forget what the term is, there's a mechanical fee of some sort that a entertainment outlet, a nightclub, has to pay a certain percentage just for playing music in their club. Right. And then a radio station pays a percentage of, you know, everything per year. I think whatever the um, overall revenue profits are of a radio station at the end of the year, they pay that to SOCAN that gets paid to the artist, you know. And that's one of the things that still today, as you know, old as radio is, and some people don't even listen to radio and they, they listen, they're, they're streaming, that radio still pays the artists way more than a Spotify does. Sure. We to this day. Right. You know? So that's one of the great things about radio that, that's still around today is artists will tell you that. You know, they they get when they get residuals and they pick up a check from airplay, you know, across Canada or North America, it's a pretty pretty nice paycheck. Compared to, you know, the the scale of what you have to do in Spotify right. or the streaming services to get a, a half decent paycheck. It's, uh, it's interesting that you brought that up because I was going to ask you how you believe the internet changed radio. Hmm. Uh, for, for better or for worse, yeah. I think, and funny... I, 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 I don't know. Yeah. We, we, I don't know. You, you, yeah. talk, you tell me. Yeah, yeah I think it's, it's interesting from a, a couple of different aspects. I think, um, you know, the interesting thing was that, that Energy 108, I think CBC was the first, but Energy 108 was the first station in Toronto and in southern Ontario to stream. Uh, the year, I think it was 96, um, first station to stream, you know, worldwide. Uh, and we were getting streaming numbers that just were just enormous. 
especially because it's a unique format too. Um, so it was huge. It was huge. But I think the, the future, um, the writing was on the wall that um, streaming eventually, I don't know if we really saw it at that time. I think we just thought saw it as an extension for radio. Right. But, you know, later on, you know, Spotify and, and the birth of that came along and that obviously changed things you know and I think also for a new generation is they want to have their own thing and it's like okay, we this, want what we is, want and we want it now yeah radio is kind right. of that's what you know mom and dad listen to and sure. the older people listen to that I want my own thing you know I might turn the radio on occasionally if I'm in the car maybe but streaming was the new way to consume music um, and I think it was just just the cool new way of doing things it's like texting. I sort of laugh at, you know, that um, it's sometimes just easier to pick up a phone and call people. But, sure. you know, years ago, all of a sudden, texting became a cool thing. Right. The, and it was the young kids that started that. Because the way that started was because it, the, the phone plans back then to, to, have, to, be, to be able to call people, you know, make X number of calls or be on the phone for an hour back then was cost a fortune. There was talk time. But there was like, oh, I can text, and it's cheap. Right. And that's where that started. And then it was like, oh, texting's kind of cool. Right. And it was like, well, why don't you phone somebody? Well, who phones? You know, I can just text them, you know? It's like, all right. Right. So I think, yeah, streaming just came a cool new way of consuming music. And then, of course, there's the playlist is infinite. Radio became more and more formatted, and playlists shrunk. And, you Is know, radio aware of this? Yes, but too late to react. Is it though? Well, I think to maybe, myself. Yeah. All right. No, no. Don't go on. No, no, I, <laughs> <laughs> I think um, at the time when that you know early on, I, I don't think uh, you're aware. Radio is aware, but also when you're you're such a, it's such it's such a corporate thing, and there's so much money happening. Um, and, and, and radio was completely taken over by corporate, you know, entities, and it was a business. It was very much a business. And when you're making so much money, it's hard to let go of that in the way you do things. It's hard to innovate uh, when there's so much money at stake. So I think radio was really slow to react to streaming. I think to myself, let's say, for example, I mean, and, and there's, there's nothing stopping this, and, and I feel like also that this is definitely, it's en route. It's you know, a matter of time. So let's say, for example, I'm not quite sure what the services charge right now. Uh, with 10 or $15 a month, I'm not quite sure what a subscription fee is for, for something. Mm. Um, uh, I think I, for Spotify, like to pay the, the non, where you don't get any commercials, or Spotify and that, I think, you know, 10 to 15 bucks a month. I'm, I think, I've yeah. got Apple Music, but yep. when I, they, they gave it to me for a year when I got this phone. The phone, I mean, I got this in August, I think, so I, I've got it until August. I've got the Apple TV, too, and uh, I, uh, I, I, I have, so because I've got it, I, I use it. Yep. I'm not going to say I don't use it. I, I absolutely use it, and sometimes it's really great for reference, and, uh, and I also enjoy building my own playlists so that I could have the music that I want to cycle through for sure know, and, and that I get to keep adding to it which is wonderful because once you get to the 200th track for example you forget what the fuck song 5 was <laughs> and, and, and then song 5 happens and you, you have that oh shit moment by yourself which is, yeah. which is super hot right but um, I'm like I mean I miss radio and, and one of the things that I do miss about radio uh, is that freedom that was provided to the DJs to express themselves on what they thought was dope. Now, if I was to say comparatively, this is essentially what a playlist is. So uh, not even my playlist. Say it's a playlist of somebody that I follow. Let's give, I, I don't follow it. It's, I don't know why this name just popped my brain right. And so it's Jake Paul who potentially saved boxing. Uh, you know, around the, around the world, you know, and, and reinvigorated the interest for it again, for better or for worse. Yeah. And and so, um, uh, Jake Paul's playlist. If I am interested in Jake Paul, and maybe this is the music that he listens to uh, when he starts boxing, um, I will I will want to hit this. But that is also, for example, laterally like a DJ mm -hmm. on FM or AM on 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 the bands. 
and that a DJ would show up and be like, I have my bag. This is what I grabbed before I left home. I wanted to hear this music. I'm not sure if we can get through all of it. Let's see where the fuck we go today. Yeah. Now, yeah. This, is, this is obviously, it's really interesting. And it also, in my opinion, adds to the brand of, let's say, again, FM radio. Because I know that, again, laterally moving back, if I go to Spotify, uh, you know, you pick any celeb, you know, from, uh, you know, a, a Jenner family member to a uh, Kardashian, or I'm not quite sure how they want to call themselves, or, or, or Paul, any one of these, any one of these awesome characters who are out there every day and, and broadcasting, mm. they've got their sound associated with that brand. So wasn't that, wasn't that part of the magic of, of what was Energy 108, for example, that I could tune in I, from 8 to 9, for I know that wasn't a slot. I'm, I'm spitballing. Okay, thanks. Sorry. I appreciate that. Uh, Chris Shepard. Yep. And then, boom, after that, Dr. Trance. Yep. You know, and then now, and then and then late night or late flight with James. Yeah. Right? DJ because, James. James Doman, yeah. Because, which, and, yes. and you know, uh, and I thought Doman had some moments late at night, man. And, and, and I mean, <laughs> yep. I had moments in my bedroom to him, that's for sure. You know, so, so. I, I think like like this is this is what brought me there and it's the reason why I'm brought if I want to use Spotify or Apple Music mm. if I want to use those apps as examples that's what's bringing me there yeah right is that I'm trusting these people with their curation skills to give me the music that I could be interested in yeah so when radio doesn't have that what's happening yeah I think you know and you touch on something that is it goes back uh, for so long that radio, because radio's been around for so long, radio's actually been very good at at being a curator of music. You know, it's it, in a sense, you know, the radio is actually, um, I guess, with all of the years of research and doing music testing, uh, it's learned a lot, and having the smart people behind it has learned a lot about how to put music together and put a playlist together and do a format um, to attract very large audiences. Radio's actually very good at that. Um, and, you know, and then having specialized hosts is another level. Um, I think, you know, radio's gotten away from allowing some power back to the DJ and the host and it's become a little bit too uh, formatted um, but the, that's the exact thing you think of which we just we did on CF and Y and we did on energy is to have these unique shows and allow allow them to do their own thing and that's their own personal playlist but you had to know you had to either like Dr. Trance and be into into trance um, music. If you didn't, you, okay, that wasn't for you. Right. And there was another show. And that, if it was, if you were right. into hip hop, it was the Mastermind Street Jam. Right. You know, and Flipside did his thing, and right. so on and so forth. So it was good having those shows. And yeah, DJ James and Night Flight and the, the live to airs each, and we did so many different clubs, but they were different DJs, and you, they had a little style, you know, and that was cool, right? So I think you know those are playlists. You know, and uh, I think um, having a a host and someone to take you along that journey, and and the, having that person there with you is one of the great things radio still does. And you know, there's there's still something missing in streaming that doesn't have that that human connection. You know, I think streaming is great, and I think there's those times you just want to hear a certain playlist and not hear. The conversation, um, but there's still a lot of people that like to uh, hear a human voice uh, and hear a story, um, and have a companion kind of there with them, right? So, um, yeah, I think there's still there's still a lot to be said for radio. I think, that, but but streaming's uh, obviously here and growing, um, but radio's still here too. Radio's, you know, not gone either. Well, what I was going to say is that you know, I think that apps are potentially a five or ten dollar per month price hike away from people yeah. going back to the FM right and and being like okay what is happening here yeah is is this of interest and that brings me nothing to, like free no <laughs> you know free still works 
that that old business model. The internet prides itself that, on that model. That, yeah, that old business model of free. <laughs> well, and it's like anything. It's like it's it's funny because we were all around when you know when YouTube first came on, right? And and I'm like, oh gosh, shit! You remember when YouTube had no commercials? That was awesome. Yeah. You know, and uh, and I use YouTube a lot, so I actually paid for the subscription. I so know some, I got, some of that we work with us. I got tired for the commercials, and here's here's the other. My other point about streaming is uh, Spotify drove me nuts. I tried Apple Music. That failed as well because I was looking for certain tracks or certain mixes of tracks. Failed every time. Right. When I went to YouTube, like 99.999% of the time, oh my God, there it is. Right. There's that mix. Right. There's that 12-inch. You're not wrong. That... I couldn't, it, there they, because somebody uploaded it. Yeah. And that's why I love YouTube. Right. And that's why I pay for it. And, 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 they, <laughs> and, they, and, they, assi and they assign the appropriate publishing to where it's got to go. That, that yes. algorithm is, is, is like, oh, you got that song. Hey, I'll just, yeah. over there. Yeah. Yeah. That's so, dynamite. Yeah, absolutely. So then I, I want to ask, could a station like Energy went away? Could, could that work today? Right now? <laughs> Boy. It's hard to say because I think because you've got a generation of people, certainly under the age of 30, that uh, there's a pretty large number that don't even listen to radio. Um, that's a huge challenge. That's a huge challenge. Um, but what, so if, what it's if gonna... there was a live to error that, that, that all of a sudden they're back in the venue? They're... Maybe. Maybe I just think it's just it's just there's just so many they're just not used to listening to the radio. They stream, they they do their thing. Um, I don't know. I don't I don't have the answer to that. I I I think if it's a younger audience you're going after, that's going to be really really tough. Right. Um, there are still some numbers that young people are still listening to radio, but not not anywhere near like if when you when you go thirty five plus. Um, the consumption of you know good old radio is still pretty strong. Numbers, the amount of hours people spend in a week listening to radio, it, it shrunk and shrinks um, little bit by little bit. But it's not just streaming that's taken their attention away. It's the you know ridiculousness of w what the internet has brought us from you know from Netflix to all these other sources, our and our you know. Social media is, you know, eating up everybody's time. The the competition for attention, you know, for yeah, for for radio, um, in the last, you know, twenty five years has just been in, insane. Is this is this an accessibility issue? Is that is that is it is it that well, we can get everything what we want when we want it? And, yeah, and because of that. Well, they're just yeah, just you know, having that little device, that smartphone. You know, the when the smartphone phone phone came along and and the, all the things you can do it literally is and some people don't even have computers anymore they they have their phone and they just the phone. They, they do everything on it right and that's pretty powerful that's pretty cool right um so it's hard to stop that so whatever it is you're doing it's you know it's got to be in that kind of on the go consume it on your device that look at i can't watch i don't know how people watch TV shows and movies. I know you can get some bigger screens today. Um, but some people are into that. I don't get it. Is, is that I still what like we a need? big is giant like a, screen on the wall. Do, do phones need to be able to pick up FM and AM bands so that so that we can? Yeah, that would be helpful. But that's right. you know that's been um, yeah they, they had a you know an FM chip. I think uh, Apple had them in their iPhones, but never turned them on because they wanted people to. Um, you know, go well now Apple Music, but they right. wanted you to go to iTunes and download the song and things like that. So I think you know some of the 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 companies have, have kind of hindered that. You know, um, but I think it's also just a natural change where a new generation comes along and they want to do their own thing, right? And they're going to do their own thing, right? And you can't stop it. No, right? Yeah. But things can uh, funny things can happen, like vinyl records. You know, right? Just you know, everybody, a lot of DJs. You know, around my age, and that started getting rid of their their records and going, oh, who's gonna 
who's going to want these and play these again? And, and all of a sudden, there was this vinyl resurgence that nobody saw coming. Maybe some people did, but it was like, holy shit, vinyl's super cool again. And there's all these, you know, young people going out buying turntables and wanting to, you know, look at and play and watch the needle go around and go, this is cool. Right. And holy shit, that happened. Right. Right. And maybe that'll happen with CDs. I kept hung onto a lot of my CDs because I still like CDs. Right. Because the the audio is great. The, the audio is they great. They sound I, great. I thought I agree with you. Yeah, and that's where streaming. Like I got that all wrong because I I didn't think streaming was going to be that big of a thing because the audio is terrible. And I thought, well, okay, they're going to improve the the audio stream. And I guess title you can get that with title and. Um, I don't know who else provides. A a Apple, Apple did an update recently. Did that, they? Yeah, the, yeah, yeah. It's, fan it's fantastic. Yeah. yeah, it's good. But it, not everybody adapted to that because for a lot of people, it's, uh, yeah, this is good enough. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that's where I wonder about, you know, CDs because I've always enjoyed CD quality and, you know, full wave audio. and But not everybody uh, listens like that. And maybe because, you know, we're into music so much and we're, you know, audio geek heads uh, but not everybody is like right that, right you know and yes. I, you know I, I over fuss about audio and you know in a nightclub if it, the sound isn't good but for a lot of people it's like they don't know right but it's loud that drives me nuts <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's like oh uh, you know it's so loud in here but uh yeah like you know i think um you know and just other things like the fact they stopped putting you know the audio jack the what do they call it the one is it 1.8? 1. 1 yeah. yeah. You can't put, you know, plug-in headphones to a lot of the new phones now. It drives me nuts. Um, and yeah, you can get a dongle. And but it's, it's why, why just just put the jack on there? Right. Um, but you know, it's the the forward-moving companies that want to, you know, oh, we want to do Bluetooth and get these, you know, five hundred dollar Bluetooth. <laughs> Earbuds, <laughs> holy shit! You gotta buy those. And you know, and Bluetooth is still—it's not as good if you, you plug it in. The audio is always going to be a little bit better if you plug it in. That's eh, old school. Uh, but anyway, you know, right. things, things can always come back. I think the jack uh, was also about making space in the phone. Yes, fair Big enough. Processor storage, yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Best live to air that you could recall, Shepard. Chris Shepard. Was there a specific Just, night or evening that you thought to yourself, holy shit, I am in, 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 I'm with magic right now? I, I can feel you know, it. I think uh, Chris defined the genre. I think he was the bar. Um, I don't think anybody ever came close to that persona. Um, in the city of love. Yeah, all of the, you know, all of that, uh, some, of, some of it was maybe put on a bit, but he just had a, a charm, charisma, a persona, a, a presence about him um, that was above and beyond anybody else. You know, from just a good programmer, you know, maybe he wasn't the slickest mixer, um, and sometimes he had some help um, mixing, but that didn't matter when uh, it was about the music presentation and um, being part of that moment, either listening to him on the air, and that was the other thing about it, is you want to be at the club that Chris was at when he was doing a live to air, but hearing him on the radio and doing his thing was super, super cool. And I think um, the two things I loved about Chris Shepard, both the, the live to air he did from a club, but he also did an in-studio show before he did, you know, mostly live to airs. Um, and that started with, you know, Saturday nights when he replaced David Marsden on CFNY on Saturday nights. It was a great show when he was taking phone calls. And, and that's where he really started to d develop that persona. And then when he went to Energy, you know, it was more in the clubs um, and him just taking it to another level. Um, City of Love and Brothers and Sisters and everything else that went along with it. But he was just a, an absolute um, uh, host extraordinaire. Like when you went to see him in a club in in the DJ booth, he made sure everybody felt like they were, you know, having the, the best time of their life. And he he was a master at that. Uh, he really was. Was everybody at Energy 108 raving and clubbing? Uh, not everybody, but uh, a number of us did. A number of us got into it and went out 
uh, and got right into the scene uh, and party, so, party just like everybody else. Okay, so yeah, what was a Monday morning like? At <laughs> <laughs> you make a good point there. I'll tell you, there were some crazy days. The '90s were crazy. From not only, not only just you know running a dance station, and it, it's twenty four seven. Right. Uh, so it's going all the time. It's it's ha happening on weekends. All of us, all of the DJs, were doing our own club gigs. In some cases, you know, I was doing two or three a week. We had people like Wayne Williams and Mike Devine that were doing four and five nights a week. Uh, it was insane. And then, you know, going to raves on weekend. Right. Um, you know, the big Saturday night, going to the rave. And then after parties. Oh, yeah. And, was, you know, essential. and it was like, you know, it would be, I'm Sunday night in either a hotel room or somebody's apartment somewhere going, shit, I got to go to work tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and and you found a way, um, and you just grinded your way back at it. And it was, but you, you were younger too, right? You know, I'll well, see so you can pull it off. Young, and get away yeah, yeah. So it's just like you know, I laugh now to think. You know, I remember you know being on the phone to people, and it's like eleven thirty, going, "Hey, you know, we're gonna head out, you know, to the club, you know, at midnight. Okay, we're gonna get going now." And it's like I'm in bed at ten o'clock now. It's like, oh my god, you know. <laughs> I wouldn't even be leaving the house till like midnight to go to a club, you know. And you remember those days? It's like you, at at eleven thirty, the club was empty, you right? Know? And midnight, that's when everybody yeah, started yeah, showing said, up. Yeah, I was, it's, it's midnight, time to go out, <laughs> yeah, it was right? Like, holy shit, you know. Right. Um, but yeah, th there were a good number of us that, that that got into the scene, and and it was just a blast. It was uh, it was a unique time. I like, I like what you said, so I'm wondering, could a tagline for Energy 108 be like, on Mondays, be like, we'll find a way. <laughs> <laughs> well, and there, and there was kind of a thing uh, that was going around, a thing called Terrible Tuesday, which was kind of like, um, it was like, if, uh, if you did an E on a Saturday night or a couple of E's, uh, some, Tuesday was the, the real downer day. That was the toughest day to get, get back. I don't know what it was about that experience, but... Uh, uh, somehow it got the name Terrible Tuesdays. <laughs> if you weren't working in radio, what would you be doing? Um, well, I, I, I'm really into road cycling. I, my big passion, uh, aside from all that crazy research I like to do and, okay. and, and posts about things, I think, you know, further research. Um, I, I love researching stuff and, 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 and just learning and relearning some things. Some of the things that I've for, kind of forgotten over the years, and I like to, the research helps me re-remember and relearn things, and oh yeah, I remember that. Um, so I like doing that, uh, and, and uh, there, I'm part of a, a team that's, that's working on um, a documentary for the Spirit of Radio days of CFNY, I mean, mostly the 80s. Um, so we're working on some funding right now. Um, so that's a fun process. So I'm helping with that. It's just a project on the side. Awesome. Um, but but my, my passion would be if I was not working, I'd be out on my bike every day. I just love road cycling. Um, and it's, you know, it's, I'm at the age where I got to look after my health. And uh, so that's important. Um, and uh, I just love being uh, out on my bike, out on the roads. It's, you know, it's a sense of freedom. Uh, it's good for you. I just love it. Yeah, I would do lots of that. Awesome sauce. Yeah. This is the uh, hot seat moment of the show. Okay. All right. Fire away. What do you believe were the three most important records during your time at Energy 108? <sighs> mm. Well, um, I think, you know, here's the, the songs that just popped into my oh, head. Oh, yeah. Let's you know, go. Rhythm is a dancer because it was, it was massive. It was one of the, I think it was the first song we played it the, when the station went on air, which was September 1992. That was the launch record, and it was a perfect song for the times because it 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 was in some ways it was an inherent techno record, in other ways it was a pop record, um, in other ways it was a Euro dance record. Um, it was just sort of setting up uh, for everything uh, moving forward from a, a, an accessible, uh, but also a club record, but it's also a radio record. You know, it was just a great track. Um, 
I, another one that just comes to mind, it's speaking of the Energy 108 days, is, um, is Ace of Base. Um, just, uh, just a perfect, you know, the Sweden has something, you know, like ABBA putting great pop records together. Hasn't stopped. Yeah, Ace of Base, um, we were, you know, there was a number of artists that we were first in North America to play. We were the first station to play Ace of Base and uh, way ahead of anybody else and it was just one of the biggest pop records in the world but we were the first in north america and and on a number of other tracks so we were really proud of that um and then i don't know why this popped into my head um is higher state of consciousness um josh Sick. wink <laughs> because because there's a track we played that on energy 108 um now it was day parted which means you know we wouldn't play it so we would play it after like 5 p.m. You know, right. Basically evenings and weekends, and we played it from the clubs. But to hear that track, you know, uh, on a commercial radio station um, is just bizarre to think about it from today looking back. It's not a radio song. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. And we there was a big show on Energy 108 called basically the top. Top 8 at 8, Wayne Williams hosted it. It was our highest rated show. Right. And people just tune in because they want to hear the hottest records. Right. And, you know, we played that. on. It was, it was number one. And it was, they, the phones went crazy. People what is this loved music? it. And I was just thinking to myself, like, there's no radio station that would ever play this. This is fucking cool. And people loved it. Right. You know, it was the most bizarre track. And... Uh, yeah, that, I don't know why that one popped into my head, but it did, because it was just uh, such a cool record. It's a breakbeat record. Yeah, you know, yes. When you th yeah. It's, yeah, in it's some not, ways, like, you think it's, it's a techno four, record, it's sure. but it is. It is. It's, yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. A, it's a breaks record. Yeah. But just what he did with, uh, and I, I, I don't know my technology, was that a 303? Or, yes. Yeah, okay. What he did with that is just amazing. Right. Uh, just fantastic. Yes. Fucking love it. And it's just you're just waiting for that, just that build. Talking, you know, that was there was a time period, uh, and it would be great to. And this is all, you know, like because I love researching. What was you know the first track that had that classic build? You know, what was the first track? You so know, the build and the drop. But anyway, that in doing that sort of technique, that I don't know the that, answer to that question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I don't know. I the answer know what to that was question. the first track because ev everybody imitated. I mean, that was definitely there, and yes. he fo he followed it up and under a pseudonym with uh, size nine. I am ready. Yeah, yeah. Right? Which is but just the those wink, but build tracks. You know, um, access is another one by DJ. That's right, DJ Tim and Mischief. Mischief was another. Right classic track of just how to build anticipation yeah the anticipation and, and just that payoff and release Woo -hoo. right Woo. but you know that josh wink track is just like that was just crazy that was good fun agreed that's yeah. fascinating yeah. i love to hear it yeah uh this is our time which has been fucking magnificent absolutely i have pleasure have me again too. anytime thanks yes thank you Genuinely. And to Thank all you. you out there that's tuned in with us, holy shit, what a giant episode. Here with Scott Turner. My name is Jello. This is the Utility Room. You are awesome sauce. We'll see you next week. Thank you very much for watching. If you've had a great time, and I hope you have, there's more awesomeness right here. Jump into these episodes. You know you want them.